There we go. Oh, no, okay. Um, morning, everyone. It is, <clears throat> um, I was going to say Friday, but it's actually Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday, July 16th, um, meeting of Buildings and Facilities Committee. Um, so let's get started. When I uh, call your names, please unmute. Well, your mics are not muted, but unmute yourself and just say yes. So, um, George? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Uh, Sharon? And I am here. Um, I see. Okay. Um, the next on the agenda is the minutes. So can we get someone to move to approve the minutes of June 16th, please? Motion to approve. A second? Oh, second. Um, any changes? No. No. All right. Um, so let's just go around. Uh, George? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Uh, Sharon? Well, I don't um, vote. Yeah, sorry. Farah, yes. All right. Okay, so um, next we have public comment. And I see we have six attendees. So if you would like to make public comment, could you please uh, raise your hand, your virtual hand, and we'll let you into the room. Uh, all right, I am seeing two hands. So first person is Arlie. Please uh, unmute yourself and speak. Good morning. Hello. Here I am again. Um, uh, I'm just thinking about the charge of this group. You know, you are charged with um, making a plan in case the expansion doesn't go through. And um, as far as I can see right now, the plan is to put an RFP out for a feasibility study for the repairs to the building. So I guess that's the plan so far. So um, I just want to offer some things I've learned uh, in the last period. If So this is if the plan to expand doesn't go through and you have to turn toward this, maybe a little good news. Um, Sarah McKee, the present president of the trustees before Austin Surratt said that if the space was used more efficiently, or most efficiently, we go from 48,000 to 51,000 feet. So there's a little more space. I realize it's not as big as the expansion. Um, I read somewhere else, I'm not sure who said this, but that the collection of books has gone down. Um, I heard some of it is because there was water dripping on some of the books, which is an unfortunate reason for the collection to go down but that there are less books than there used to be. So maybe um, less shelving is needed so they could be moved farther apart. You know, I hear the, the reasons for the expansion. If people can get into the building because it's accessible, but they can't go through the aisles, that's not, doesn't make any sense, right? So I understand that. So if we can't do the expansion, Maybe there's ways to maximize the space and get some more space so that they could get in and get around, at least in some places. So I just thought this would be, you know, again, I know you're not thinking in these ways yet because this expansion is not off the table completely at this point. I understand that. But, you know, it would be nice, you know, just to, you know, there is... I guess what I want to say is that the expansion is not wholly good and the repair option is not wholly bad. There's good and bad in both of these scenarios. You know, and one of the things I'll say is, you know, if the expansion does go through, 
you know, you talk a lot about inflation and stuff, and that inflation will continue through the building process. And I read um, a person talking about at UMass when they were going to build three towers, and when you, they got to the third tower, the price of steel went up immeasurably. They couldn't afford to build the third tower, so they had to build a like a one-story building that they made into a dining commons or something. So you know, these are what I would call known unknowns. You know that inflation is happening. You don't know how much it's going to be. So this is a known unknown. There's going to be unknown unknowns as well that are going to come up. You know, everything has risk and problems and cost to them. Um, so I just would say that if the repair option is the one we have to go to, it wouldn't be wholly bad, you know, these letters have surfaced about the adverse effects to the historical status of the building. You know, if you don't go through with an expansion, that's a headache that you completely goes away because, you know, there are rules and laws about historic preservation that are coming into play and those are going to affect this project and possibly bring cost to the town if they're not um, adhered to. So, you know, when we're talking about cost and stuff to say, you know, this one's cheaper for the town and this one's more expensive for the town, I think that way of thinking and talking has to go out the window because it's getting very mushy and muddled and kind of a wash at this point. Okay, I will stop at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arlie. Um, next is Maria. Maria, please let your um uh, unmute yourself. Thank you, Maria Kopicki, South Amherst. Uh, two things. One is that I have noted at uh, these meetings, and it actually several other meetings. This is not unique to you. Um, a number of opinions get stated during the meeting, and what I would like to see is documentation and evidence provided for any statements that you make and provided in the packet and to the public. Uh, the other thing is I'm going to once again request that you either announce the attendees to these meetings or make them visible to the public. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, I don't see any other hands. Up. Does anyone else want to make public comment? Nope. Okay. So let's move on to monthly buildings and grounds report. George, what do you have for us? Air conditioning working? Hmm. Um. So, uh, as we all know, we've been in a very lengthy heat wave. It seems like it's been going on forever, but um. You know, pretty much every day it's been 90 plus. Uh, and that can be taxing on anybody's AC system. I don't care how new or old it is, but we are dealing with 30 plus year old equipment. Um, there have been, you know, a few breakdowns here and there. This past weekend we had, uh, this part of the town had a power bump. Uh, and whenever that happens, that, that affects a lot of things, especially in a building like this. But, uh, you know, some of the systems had to be reset uh, because they don't come back on their own. Um, but really, the bottom the bottom line is, you know, the, the system's old. It's being taxed very heavily. I mean, if anybody has a 30-year-old air conditioner in their house, and I'm certainly not trying to make that comparison, but 30-year-old equipment on long heat waves like this is just very taxed. And... Um, a good portion of my day is spent just monitoring the equipment and making sure that it's operating as good as it can and that uh, it's not being tripped from being overworked, uh, that the drains for condensation aren't getting clogged up uh, and flooding parts of the building because that happens, especially when there's they're putting out as much condensation as they are right now. Um, so yeah, it's... It's working as good as it can be given its age. Um, and we're just staying on top of it as best we can. 
<clears throat> there were some problems in the Woodbury room, right? Uh, last week during an, a, a program. Yeah, the, the you know, there, there's, there's a main water pipe uh, that the valve is, we, we've talked about this before. We talked about it at great length last year. Uh, th there's a valve that's frozen and to replace it would incur some demolition just because of its location. Uh, and unfortunately that reduces the effectiveness of air conditioning in portions of the building, uh, including the Woodbury room. So on days when we've just had multiple days of 90 plus degrees, it's hard for the rest of the AC to keep up. And, you know, under normal circumstances, if you have a reasonable summer, um, you know, the rest of the air conditioning in the building kind of makes up for the losses in places where there aren't air conditioning. But uh, the Woodbury room's been getting very warm lately just because there's just not enough AC to go around. Right. Um, and what about leaks? Do, just the usual ones during the rains? Because we've had like some weird bursts of rain. Yeah. Yeah. We've had the usual roof leaks, um, mostly in the atrium. But, you know, there's other parts of the building, especially the original parts of the building where the, the, the roof has failed. And um, if we get heavy rains, the water backs up and it, it comes into the building. Um George, I think I think you need to talk about what happened in special collections. So yeah, I, was gonna, I'm I was gonna do that too. Great. Um so yeah, when we it was probably a few weeks after we changed over to air conditioning, we had another leak above special collections. Uh there was a flood, the water came down two levels, uh, down to the main floor. It affected a section of the mystery collection. Uh, I don't have the totals on how many books were lost. Um, I believe at this point, nothing in special collections was damaged. I haven't talked to Catherine uh, in the past few days. Um, so yeah, but it was, it was basically the condensation drain pipes got clogged. They backed up and created a flood. And this happens not, it, it's not just because the drains aren't cleared. They're cleared every year. Uh, we, we make a point of making sure that the drains are, uh, are as open as possible. But a lot of the equipment is older and there's rust and there's things that just are going to clog a drain. So if, if loose rust particles get into the drain, it's going to clog it. The water's going to back up. And it doesn't take very long for it to happen. Uh, we check... We check about special collections almost every day just to ensure that everything is okay. When this happened, it happened on a long weekend. Uh, so we had about a day and a half where there wasn't any supervision on it. And unfortunately, that was long enough for water to come down three floors and do a lot of damage. Wow. But we we cleaned it up. It was it was an, it was fortunate slash unfortunate circumstances. The day it was discovered was when we were having the professional carpet cleaners in here. So uh -huh. we were already close to the public. Uh, so it made it a little bit easier to do proper cleanup and make sure everything was dried up before we were opened. But thankfully somebody was here working with those contractors so that we discovered it and it didn't go another day. Right. And how often are the pipes unclogged, George? We have, we have, uh, we, we contract for regular scheduled maintenance. They come in uh, every month and do filters. I would say that the, especially during the summer months, every month when they come, they check the drains. Okay. Uh, but again, we are checking them almost daily to make sure that nothing is going on. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, anything else? Sharon, anything to add to that? Isn't that enough? No. It's good. <laughs> okay. Uh, any questions, Tammy? Any questions? No? Okay. All right. Uh, plan B, backup building project planning. So, yeah. So, right now, uh, let's see where we're at. Um, we have our building committee meeting tomorrow where we will discuss... I mean, the architects are going to come and show us, I guess, renderings of our 
uh of the yes i don't sir? think we'll i don't think we'll see renderings i could be wrong i don't okay. um uh i'm not we sure what we'll actually chat. see but okay. we will hear about yeah okay. but <clears throat> meanwhile um yeah as it is it's the charge of this committee to work on plan v simultaneously which is a little hard because we won't we're just going to have to be ready to pivot on the day after if the bids don't come in where we need them to come in but meanwhile um Sharon, can we go over a little bit of what's been going on in terms of with the town? And I know there was a, we had a meeting with the architects yesterday or one of the architects yesterday. So, yeah. So first I, I've, I had a discussion with Paul just to talk about, you know, the library's updated five-year plan, which is in your packet. Um, and, and how we will be, you know, the, the correct process for plan B is, it just is what it is um the uh we'll be asking for money for feasibility study and then for work to be done and and we've laid that out george and i have laid that out um over the next 10 plus years uh as and you know this is our initial best guess and then every year just like the jcpc process itself it's a the process is a it's a living being it it, it changes every year depending on what what you know, emergency needs pop up and how much money is available. So that will dictate how, how long this process takes. Um, we, uh, because there have been calls for an updated, um, updated accessibility plan, uh, the numbers that we got from Kuhn Riddle back in 2020, um, Bob, Bob Parent uh, at, um, was able to calculate uh, escalation figures, and I, I don't remember the the number, the percentage that he added, um, and that that got us, you know, bottom line increases to give people an idea uh, of how much more it's actually going to cost. Um, we met with Kuhn Riddle yesterday. the The goal was to find out how much it would cost from them uh, if we were to hire them to give us updates on uh, what they had proposed back in 2020, you know, what they built upon that, that started with uh, Western builders. Anyways, long story short, um, it, it, it would cost us about $44,000 in order for that, in order to hire them to give us an updated cost estimate. Um, and the reason for that is because what was presented in 2020 actually can't be done today because of this um, energy code updates, building code updates, uh, um, the sustainability efforts that that have been enacted by the town of Amherst. So um, I, I have a I took a ton of notes. You know, there wasn't any documentation as a result of this. We were just having a conversation and we were really just trying to find out, hey, can you tell us more about what your 2020 report is uh, so that we can explain to folks, you know, it um, what the town would actually get. And and that's when she started talking about how she spoke with engineers at Tie and Bond Um and and they started talking about how big of a project this would be to come up with a cost, excuse me, to come up with a, an actual updated uh, deferred maintenance estimate, whatever you want to call that, accessibility. Um, so, for example, the 2020 plan was asking for a larger gas service to the building. Um we actually can't do that uh, for a couple of reasons. And George, you're going to fill in all the gaps that I, that I make a mistake on, um, you, you know, the town, it, not only is there a moratorium through Eversource, but also um, the town is requiring that we move to electrification. So, um, so an entire redesign would have to be done on the HVAC system. Um, what other things did we talk about? Please hold. Um, I'm just going through my notes. Um, uh, did they, did, was there a conversation about the elevator and the, um, the millwork 
Any anything about the paneling or the historic elements? Yeah, they did say they would have to they'd have to delve more into that to find out exactly. So in 2020, what they were, what that cost estimate was presenting was whatever they touched, whatever got damaged or poked and put holes in, whatever, that would be repaired. So whether it was wood or plaster, um, it would get fixed. But it did not take into account historic woodwork and the asbestos. So the asbestos piece alone um makes the makes the repair option that much more complicated was her point and she doesn't she doesn't know and that in in 2020 it wasn't even uh contemplated what it would mean to the historic woodwork basically whatever would be taken out would not be replaced um oh, uh, go okay. ahead the millwork would not be replaced if it's taken out for asbestos abatement. So what what would be do they have any idea what they would put back or no they, I I Yeah, they 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 don't just because the that estimate did not go very deep. It it, it wasn't a highly detailed estimate. It wasn't like what we have from Feingold Alexander. It never it never went into that kind of detail. So mm -hmm. But the there's two issues that could affect the woodwork in the repair only option. Uh, one of them being, you know, now we understand that there's a presence of asbestos in the original structure. Anytime that they're going to have to uh, go into the plaster for any kind of HVAC replacement or even looking down the line for electrical replacement, now they have to think about asbestos remediation uh as far as the woodwork goes if they have to remove some woodwork or drill into some woodwork for different hvac points now that we're looking at not replacing the system that we have is as it is that we're looking at different types via either heat pumps or whatever what have you it's possible that some of the original mill work may have to come off or or be modified in some way. They don't know yet. Okay. Um, and, you know, unless we, you know, I believe that, that that they were going to come and just do a little bit of an exploratory to give us a better idea. But until we pay somebody to do a full on study. Um, thank you. Uh, full on study, we're, we're really not going to know exactly what would be affected in the repair only option anymore just because it's so much different now all the all those code changes mm -hmm. um the presence of the asbestos just there's there's so many changes now that it's almost impossible to look at that quote right. and and use it as a model anymore because things have changed so much in however many years it's been she right. did say that uh it would be impossible to avoid the the ADA you know making the building accessible uh, because of all of the extensive needs. She said the costs have gone up between 20 and 40 percent since 2020. Um, uh, hang on, I've got to keep going. Um, Sharon, can I just say something? I mean, yeah. Funeral had given us two estimates, you know, 16 and 14 million, depending on on how many stages. And she said that those estimates would be 20 to 40% higher. And for the work on, on HVAC, that would tend to be the 40% higher. So, yeah. you know, I mean, while we don't have the actual figures, it does give you an idea that we're talking close to $20 million. Um, if you take her estimate um, from 2020, and then she said through COVID and the escalation, it's just gone through the roof. Because um, so, I, I took some notes too. But anyway, yeah. sorry to interrupt. No, no, thank you, Tammy. So, um, sorry, George, do you want to finish? Because I, I want, I, I, like, while I have these thoughts in my head. I'm <laughs> yeah. To, uh, yeah, no, I, and I was, I was just going to say, you know, those two estimates for like phasing it, um, you know, that's a best case scenario that, that if, if we could afford to do that, um, you know, but it the doesn't cost include would be a little... asbestos. 
It, do, that it doesn't. It doesn't include asbestos. asbestos, right? And it doesn't include uh, the full-on. Oops, did we lose Tammy? The the electricity, as opposed to yeah. Yeah. yeah so, you know, it's the way Sharon and I feel is that we wouldn't be able to afford, we don't see how the town could afford to do those two phased options that we would have to do it through JCPC on what as much smaller projects to spread it out. But as to what Sharon said, even spreading it out on 10 years, it's highly likely we're going to hit that ADA threshold, uh, you know, depending on where the projects are placed. And it's likely we'll just won't be able to avoid it at all, which, you know, I don't want to give a personal opinion, but I, I kind of feel like ADA is pretty important and I feel like we shouldn't be avoiding doing it, but you know, that, um, again, that's my opinion. So in regard to ADA, um, compliance, do we know, like, are there grants out there that we could, you know, we have a lot of resourceful people in our community who could probably, because, you know, a lot of people are uh, supporting Plan B, and maybe we can tap into those resources and see if people can get be out there looking for grants. And do we know if, if that is a possibility, Sharon? If people are willing to do that for free, absolutely. Okay, so that would, be, that, that would be pretty amazing because there's so many supporters of Plan B. Maybe we can tap into them and they could, you know, really help us and that would help reduce costs. Um, can I, uh, any, I know there was conversation about the skylight because it's going to be, I mean, it would still be skylight, but replaced, but double glazed. Um, Triple. Yeah, Triple yeah, because of, because of the energy code changes, it would have to be triple triple glazed uh, glass, okay. so that's going to drive the costs up as well. But again, it's a it's it was a code change, so it's something that we would absolutely have to do. Okay, um, and the um, the other main thing that I've been thinking about forever is the elevator, right? Because right now, if you're in a wheelchair, you can't turn around in it. If you, I was uh, amazed to hear Sharon that. You can get a stretcher in there, but upright. So Diagonal. then what do they do when a person is strapped onto the stretcher? Are they still upright or how how do they even bring someone out in the stretcher? Upright right now? I'm I'm looking at George. I, I've only seen the stretcher go down. I haven't seen it come back up I was going to say, again. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, fortunately, we haven't seen this happen much, but yeah. Uh, I would like to get an opinion from, you know, somebody from the um, the town EMTs as to uh, what the better option is, either trying to get somebody down the elevator or down the staircase. Neither one of them are compliant. So I th that is a question for for, you know, somebody in, in the town fire department to to answer that question. What would be the better option? Because I, I honestly couldn't tell you. Neither, neither are a good option. Okay. Um, you know, if we're just replacing the elevator and getting a variance, it's not helping the people who need ADA compliant elevators. Right. Uh, they still would not be able to get up to the original part of the structure. Right. Uh, now, making the elevator shaft larger is going to obviously going to cost a lot more it's you're also going to get into removing historic woodwork because if you think about where that original elevator is it's it's kind of at the center of the historic building and it goes up you know all three floors so all three floors wherever surrounds that elevator is going to be affected if we if we increase the size of it so let me get this right so no matter what like you know we're we're just focusing on plan B, no matter what happens, mm -hmm. we can't, if we want to change the size of the elevator, which will cost more, we're going to get into historic woodwork. If we do a, as we have to do asbestos abatement, that we're still going to get into historic woodwork. So no matter what, forget the elevator for now, which I don't want to forget about because yeah. we have so many in the community who need to use that. Um, we're still going to, face this problem with the with the millwork right 
I mean, we we're not going to have it whole as the as many people in this community. I mean, I I mean the historic preservation angle. It's still going to be a problem. Yeah, I mean, anything can be great, done yeah. with any amount of money. So, right. um, you know, we could be required to replace that woodwork, you know, preserve it, abate it, preserve it and, and all that. But it's going to cost a lot of money. Right. I mean, what it, what this comes down to is anybody who says that plan B can be done less expensively. It's just yeah. wrong and, and, and is not basing those opinions on fact. Plan B is exorbitantly more expensive to the taxpayer than the expansion renovation project. Um, I, so this other thing that came and, you know, you hear teenagers talk. My teenager was like, she has a friend who's really um, involved and is a youth activist. And she was talking about talk among her group of friends. And there was some, because my, you know, she came in and she was like, mom, apparently you can get this repair option done for five or six million dollars. And I was like, where did you hear that? And she said, you know, blah, 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 through this movement or whatever. So that is not true, right? So not I'm, I'm not sure why that's out there no. in the community that we can just do these fixes for five or six million dollars. Because the reality is even a study or even to get to hire the architects to do a study is going to be, what did you say, Sharon? $44,000. $44, and that's, and that's, just, and that's just to update what we've got. Right. right. That's just to update what we've got. Right. Okay. Um. So, we, so, okay. So let's just pivot a little bit to, we have these details from your meeting yesterday. So, Let's look at our next steps, right? We were charged with a plan. I know that there's a, you've sent a plan out to Paul. That's been done, right? Since our last meeting. So what is the next step for us as a community or, or as, a, as a committee or the next step for the library? Like what are the things that we can set in place until we get, to the point when we go out to bid. So George is working with Holly on, on the actual process and George will put together a, a timeline um, mm -hmm. that will say, okay, we issued the RFP on this date and uh, we solicit three quotes on this date and that'll get us through um, FY25. Okay. Yeah, because it's, if we were just using town money, it would be different. You know, all those standards are in place, but because you know, the trustees were using part of the endowment for the repair only option. We have to be careful to make sure that we're following all the town policies because the endowment amount is not going to be enough to cover all of this. So, right. you know, I'm having conversations with, you know, Holly to determine, you know, should we just start with town contracts right from the start? Uh, is it some kind of hybrid thing? Because it's kind of new territory as far as something like this goes. Usually, if we have a big capital projects, we apply to JCPC. It's town funds, town contracts, and all of that. But if we're just spending corporation money for part of it, we just need to determine what is the best plan of action for that? What is the proper business practice for that? And that's what we're working on right now. Okay. So you're working on that. So say, um, Sharon, give me a... Uh, can you can you give me a ballpark like time like a month? So if we go out to bid, we had said twelve weeks to FAA, so that brings us to June, June September. My math. Uh, is are are you talking about the building project? Yeah, the... I'm talking about. Sorry, uh, if I'm just going back to the renovation expansion for a minute. Okay. So if we okay. go out to bid in September, June, yeah. July, August, and six to six to eight weeks, or oh, for the bids to come in, uh, um, I I hadn't thought that far in advance. I haven't. I don't okay. know. So if we go out, I don't want to speculate yet. Uh, I think what we were talking about is bids coming in end of November, beginning of December. I, I'd have to look into that. Okay. So 
Just looking ahead to that. So George, you could you would have um an RFP if if the bids don't come within budget, you would have an RFP ready to go out the next day. Yes, yeah, is that that's, that, that's that, the goal. Is that possible? That that's is the goal. goal. And and this is again, this is to just to clarify, um, this is an RFP for HVAC redesign new HVAC. It's not for the entire project. Right. This is just specifically the RFP because we are doing, we're planning on going forward and doing this a piece at a time. Right. Uh, if we did an RPA for, if we did an RFP for the entire project and year one, it's going to change in five years. Mm -hmm. So right. I don't see the value in doing one for an entire project when we're going to have more energy code changes. We're going to have more, you know, all of these things that we're dealing with right now. So the RFP is specifically for the HVAC. Okay. So that goes out in December, say, and then Yeah, reasonably. And then what would what would a time I'm sorry, I know this is asking a lot because you're just like, oh, this could happen and that could happen. But what would be a like an estimate, a timeline moving forward from there? Do we go to JCPC in February? Because that's when they start meeting again. Or do we use like what are the funds that we tap into first? Is it the endowment? The It'll be the 1.8, yeah. yeah okay. and, and yeah. Okay, so we do the RFP for the HVAC. Then that, that goes into process. But meanwhile, do we hire Kuhn Riddle or are we going to do that simultaneously now for to find out, to sort of get an estimate of what the cost might be. Sorry, Sharon, am I, yeah. No, no, so the RFP would be for, uh, you know, to, to hire somebody for a feasibility study. So that's A. B yeah. would be uh, George soliciting three quotes in order to have the uh, fire alert system and the sprinklers replaced. Okay. So that's a set, that's a separate pro process. Okay. Um, and figuring out the children's room abatement piece, that's really important too. Um, yeah. So that would be soliciting three more quotes for that piece. So, so that's what we would be looking to do. So that's six six quotes, like three sets of quotes. Right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And that would take us well into next year. Mm -hmm. And then if that took us well into next year, when would we presume that any work could start, could begin on the HVAC system? So in theory, what we would also do would be uh, submitting a request for the HVAC replacement for FY26. So it's going to get complicated. We'll have to work with JCPC to figure out how all of these balls line up. Um, but it's because, you know, we're spending 1.8 and then the minute it gets to 1.899 cents, that's when the town dollars kick in. Um, and it, And it's hard to say you know, when we'll get to that point. So there's a lot of, we just don't know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think I had so many thoughts in my head. I think I covered most of them. You know, one wow. other, one other thing that I, that I'm going to ask for clarification on is, you know, right now we, right now we are sitting on, you know, a state grant for, from the MVLC for the project. I don't know if we can apply for any other grants for plan B with that grant existing. I'm not a grant writer. I don't know what the legalities about that are. Right. Um, we may have to wait until that grant is, if, if the project doesn't go forward, we might have to wait until that grant is not in play anymore before we can apply for different grants. That's but, a grant yeah, I, I can't imagine us applying for grants without a without a project. Right, right, exactly. But also, that so grant talking. has to be has to be um, repaid. If the project doesn't go forward, right. the entire MBLC grant has to be repaid back to the to the MBLC. We don't keep that money. I think that needs to be uh, really clear. Right, and who would? I mean. 
why would you want to turn around and give us a grant right away? But um, okay. Um, let me just see. And the other thing with the with Plan B, Sharon. Uh, what about features like windows? Would they repair windows? Just paint, patch them up? I mean, what what that, would they That's play? what the twenty twenty estimate was looking at. Was just repairing. Okay. Um, yeah. And so assuming repairing is cheaper than replacing, then yeah, that's what plan B would be, would be repairing. Okay. And then stuff like the interior, would it just be paint and uh, Again, repaired. Yeah. Carpeting everywhere. I mean, the all, all the carpets got to go. Yeah. It's really gross. Uh, it was my understanding that Coon Riddle was, um, that the, the architect from Coon Riddle with whom we spoke was going to provide a list of what was included in that grant. Isn't that correct, Sharon? Yeah, so she's going to know. Yeah, we would know about the windows and the paint and all those details. Yeah. yeah. And that'll be good so that people can in the community can can, you know, talk about facts. Right. Exactly. OK. Um, all right. So there is a, a loose a loose plan. I mean, I know you guys have been working on <clears throat> this. Um, there's a plan to Paul. George is working with Holly timeline, and we would be ready to get an RFP out there day after if the bids don't go according to uh, come within budget. Okay. Yeah. And we have a uh, we have a meeting tomorrow, so we'll learn more from the architects about that. Um, anything else? Does anyone, Tammy, any more questions? I think I've covered most of mine. I Sharon, just think I just think the big important thing is to understand that whatever estimates we had in the past um, do not include all the work we need to have done. And with all the escalation of costs since COVID, that um, we're looking at significantly much bigger chunk of money than than the the estimates from Western Builders and Kuhn Riddle. And I think that's just really important to keep in mind. Yeah, and I think the other thing that was really like was bothering me every time I thought about that was um, the fact that you would have to move out maybe twice, move out of the building twice. I don't know what just happened, but everything just froze everybody on froze. me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I was like, is it just me or is it everybody? <laughs> I uh, no, I Tammy was, was speaking last for me. <laughs> yeah. Now Tammy is mute. Tammy, you're still mute. We can't hear you. Tammy, you're muted. I love technology. Yeah. Oh, we lost oh. her. I, I, I got logged off. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear yes. you. Okay, I was just commenting that it's really important to keep in mind that the estimates we had from Western Builders and Coon Riddle were uh, way before COVID and the increases in cost since COVID have been dramatic. And also those estimates did not include asbestos abatement, you know, meeting energy codes, the gas moratorium. So I think we're looking at such a huge chunk of money more that we, it needs to be kept in mind that this is not five to six million, it's not 10 million, it's more likely, based what? on the Kuhn Riddle estimates, more likely to be closer to $20 million over time. And that did not include, none of her estimates included the cost of moving out of the building if asbestos, when asbestos is abated, et cetera. 
Yeah, and just I'm glad you just mentioned that, Tammy, because what I said when we froze was the fact that you would have to move out not once, but probably yeah. twice, right? And that that yeah. would be and that would include taking everything out of the library twice or just the it human depends on what the work is. Yeah. Okay. Um Plan B is not good. That needs yeah. to be the headline everywhere. Plan B is not good. Not at all. Yeah. And, and the idea that we can rearrange the library to make a little more space here and there is yeah. somewhat unrealistic given the way libraries operate and um well I think space and, configuration. Yeah, and I think the I think the one thing I, I the one other thing I wanted to ask Sharon is how's the staff feeling? I mean I can see Awful. how Ford is feeling, but <laughs> Awful. Um, you know, yes. it, I, not only is it hot uh, here, but um, it it's very discouraging. It's really discouraging. Um, this is not a good place. It's not a good building to be working in. No. And to have these constant start and stops it is um, psychologically, it, it's, it's, okay. it's yeah. hurting them. Well, can you please tell them that we appreciate every every time I go in there, I tr I try to tell them. So let's Thank have you. more people in the community doing that because I can't imagine that this is easy. And we appreciate everything that you all are doing. Thank you. And you, George, yes. do you have air conditioning where you're sitting? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> teeny, teeny, <laughs> tiny. <laughs> well, I'm really sorry. I I'm okay. sorry too because I I. This heat is so oppressive that to have um, problems with the HVAC system is just unimaginable. Yeah. And I'm yeah. so sorry for you and this, your staff and the library staff working under these um, circumstances. Yeah, but the program is still going on, so we really appreciate that with enthusiasm. Okay, so topics not anticipated. Any topics? Nobody? I, I don't have anything. All right. So should we adjourn? We have a, our next meeting is August 20th, right? Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Stay cool. Hang in have there, Sharon day. and George. Thank you so much. You. Take thank care. Bye-bye. Some of you tomorrow. Bye. Okay.